Welcome to Dairy Robot Radio, the show that provides answers to your most pressing questions about dairy farming and automation. Each episode will focus on a major topic within the dairy industry and will feature experts throughout our industry and within Laylee to help provide information and different perspectives on automation. And now, here's your host, Bolana Putz. On this episode of Dairy Robot Radio, Laylee's Caden Swanevelt is going to help you to understand what we mean about optimizing the milking process with properly fitted liners, how long those liners should remain in the robot, and the advantages and differences of the Laylee portfolio of liners. So let's learn from Caden. So Caden Swanevelt, tell us about you and your role with Laylee. So my role with Laylee, um, I've been with Laylee for just over a year and I'm an aftermarket field specialist covering the western half of North America. Okay, so Caden, what does your role mean to a dairy producer? Um, My role to a dairy producer is I'm there to help ensure that uh, they're cleaning their robots properly and that they have the proper aftermarket consumable parts in the robot. Um, I can help them make those decisions side by side with the Laley Center. And what all products does the Laley Center provide to uh, their customer base? Countless products. Um, should be all the, the hygiene products, from our alkalins to our acids to our brush disinfectants and our, our post-treatment product, um, as well as the, the consumables, inflations, brushes, wear parts, anything that goes into the maintenances and so on. So let's talk to our audience a little bit about m- the milk harvesting process. and. What goes into making the milking process optimal? When I think of an optimal milking process, I really think of three things. Um, The things that come to mind for me are our pre-treatment, and then during milking, and then our post-treatment. And to to make those things optimal, we need to make sure that we have the right settings um, throughout all all three stages. On the pre-milking, we need to make sure we have the proper brushes on the robot, um, along with the, the proper concentration of brush disinfectant. Um, and time. We need to make sure that uh, those, those brushes are giving us the proper amount of prep time that the cow needs to let down her milk. Um, during milking, we really need to focus on the cow to make sure that she's comfortable and she's being completely milked out. Um, that, that to me is an optimal milking, that the cow is comfortable and she's completely milked out. And then on the, the post-treatment, we need to make sure that we have a, a good product in the robot that sprays and that's accurately hitting the teats to help kill that bacteria after the cow leaves the robot. So what are some of the things that producers need to you know, really hone in on when it comes to those three phases? Particularly, let's start with the pre-milking process. Yeah, I think one of the most simple things that can be done on the, the pre-milking process is to ensure that we have brush disinfectant in the barrel. Um, there's been times when we showed up to farms and, and that barrel's empty Oftentimes that could be for, you know, the last three or four minutes, but sometimes that could be for three to five days prior to when we were there. Um, so, so go around and kick that drum every day, make sure that that product's actually there, and make sure it's getting on the brushes. And you talked about completeness of harvest. So what are some of the settings or what, what should producers be looking for during that part of the milk harvest? Yeah, we, we want to make sure that the inflations aren't staying on the cow for too long or too short. Um, we have different reports that we can pull to show the producers whether that's coming off too early or not. As far as takeoff settings, those are, are completed in T for C. We want to make sure that those are set right for the herd. And then what are some of the best practices or tips that you would talk to folks about when it comes to post-treatment? Um, yeah, really just make sure that you have a, a product that sprays well through the robot. Um, Laylee has a few different products that, that are designed to spray through the robot. Um, you know, make sure we do have a couple different nozzles as well. So make sure that the right nozzle is installed for the product you're using. And uh, just, just watch the cow. I mean, watch it be done and make sure we're hitting the teats. If not, work with the, uh, the local TSS guys to get those settings adjusted properly. So you mentioned um, the right inflations and liners. What role do liners play in milk harvest? Oh, well, liners are, are key in milk harvest. That is the one thing that actually touches the cow during the the milking process. Um, The liners are really what translate all settings to the cow. Whether that be pulsation or takeoff or vacuum, the the liner is what sends all those signals to the cow itself. 
So do we just have one liner that fits all, or, you know, if I contrast this to a clothes, small, medium, large, 2XL, you know, 3XL, what can you tell us about Laylee liners? Yeah, so to answer your first question, um, absolutely not. There, there's not one liner that fits all. And uh, a lot of people think that's the case with the Laylee liner. Um, you know, I've been on farms that aren't using a Laylee liner. I ask them why, and they tell me the, the Laylee liner doesn't work for their herd. Um, I, I continue to ask, which Laylee liner? And they, they look at me like I'm crazy. They say, well, you know, the Laylee liner. It, it needs to be known that Laylee has multiple liners that will fit a variety of herds. Um, and it, it's critical to make sure that we have the right liner for the right herd. And so really, what is the function of the liner in the robot? Yep, so the liner is, uh, is what harvests the milk. Um, the liner is what massages the teat in the robot to allow the cow to continue to drop that milk. And then I guess how long should producers expect liners to, to you know, to be on the robot? What's the lifespan? Yeah, so that's gonna vary as well by uh, which liner you you go with. The Laylee silicone liner will last 10,000 milkings, whereas the, the US Laylee rubber liner lasts 1,500 milkings, and the Canadian rubber liner lasts 2,500 milkings. And what's the difference in the material of rubber versus silicone? Silicone's going to last longer than rubber. Rubber will typically milk out a little faster. And obviously, 10,000 milkings with the silicone is, in the eyes of some, a pro. What are some of the other pros and cons behind each liner material? Yeah, so I, I think a huge pro behind silicone, um, like you mentioned, we, we don't have to change it near as often. I know here lately we're focusing on being a sustainable company. And uh, just the fact that we're throwing away, you know, six or seven times less the amount of liners, that, that can be a huge pro with silicone as well. Um, cost, you really need to look at the cost between the two as well. Uh, by the time you, you change the rubber six or seven times to, to keep up with the silicone, is it really cheaper per milking? Um, those are a few more things you need to look at when you're looking at the pros of the, the two different liners. So, Caden, there's a lot of variables when it comes to pros and cons and differences in silicone versus rubber liners. But if a person wanted to calculate their short and long-term costs of liners, how, how do you guide them through that process? Yeah, so the most simple way would be uh, we've actually recently developed a, a neat little inflation calculator, which will show us how often we need to change our inflations, as well as the cost per milking. Um, in order to, to take a look at that and make sure you swing by the Laylee booth at the World Dairy Expo. Um, we'll have some of those live and running on, on iPads there. And also you can find it on Laylee.com. How can liners impact herd health? It's, it's huge. Like I said before, we need to make sure that uh, we have the proper liner for the proper herd, which means we're, we're milking the cows out completely and comfortably. Um, if we're not doing those things, we're going to cause a lot of teat end damage. We're going to cause uh, congestion in the teat, which a lot of times you may not see the, the impact of that tomorrow or the next day. But uh, later on in the lactation, you'll, you'll see it big time and into further lactations as well. Um, we can show people where they're using a wrong inflation and it is coming off too early and they, they are causing a huge impact on the production p potential of that herd. And how does a farmer determine which liner he or she should be using in the robot? What are some of the tips that you talk to folks about? So one thing that we, we definitely like to do is uh, working with the local FMS advisors at the Laley Centers is going in and sizing the teats of the herd. And uh, we have a little interactive spreadsheet that'll then make the decision for us of which inflation we should be using. Um, that, that's one thing that should be done for sure. Um, another important thing you can do on robot herds is you can set up different pens, which will then allow us to keep you know, a smaller teated heifer group in one pen and then a more mature cow group in another pen. Um, that lets us use different inflations for different groups as well, which is uh, very convenient. Um, but one of the, the key points to choosing a liner is watch the cow. I mean, standing there and watch the cow, she, she will give us signals that lets us know she is comfortable or she is not. Caden, how many different silicone and rubber liners are there offered by a Laylee Center? So within our current portfolio, um, we have seven silicone part numbers that are available throughout the United States and Canada. 
And then we have one rubber in the United States and two rubber in Canada. So they've got nine different choices to properly fit the right liner for their herd. And as you mentioned, you know, when they go through that annual observation of the udders and really best fitting the right liner for the herd, um, they can select from those nine different options and then sort their cows and put them in pens accordingly to, to get that best fit and that most comfortable harvest of the milk. You mentioned a word that I've heard once or twice in, in talking about this process, squawk. What is squawk? So a squawk is where a, a liner is going to slip down the teat a little bit and it's going to admit airflow in the, uh, the mouthpiece of the, the liner there between the teat. Um, that typically tells us we have a, a liner that doesn't fit properly. Um, you know, that liner should stay on the cow throughout the whole milking. It shouldn't come down and bounce back up. Um, that's very uncomfortable for the cow when that does happen. And as I said, oftentimes that ends, ends up removing the liners too early and we're leaving that unharvested milk on the table. So what does a person do if they, they're here in squawk? Um, I would definitely consult with your local Laley Center to decide if you, you have the right liner in place or not. So I, I was just on a dairy here yesterday and the day before and I saw a cow picking up her leg. I mean, what are some of those signals um, that you, you advise that, that people should be looking for? Yeah, I mean, if everything's hooked up and running like it's supposed to, um, you know, the brushes are out of the way and we're a good 45 seconds into the milking and that cow just can't hold still, she, she's not comfortable. Um, so a few different things we need to look into in those situations are vacuum levels, you know, pulsation settings, but uh, definitely the liner that is being used. Um, if we can rule out that we have the right liner, then it's a good idea to dig into some of those more technical things. But uh, just, just watch her. If she's moving around and, you know, she's still got feed in the, the bowl, she's, she's obviously not comfortable. How often, how frequently um, should people be looking at liners? I mean, is this a daily thing, a monthly thing? What do you advise people? I mean, as far as looking at the liners that are on the robot, just look at it as part of the maintenance. One of the last things you want is to have a, a cracked or ripped liner because um, then you end up clogging up pulsation and making a bigger mess. Oftentimes right on the, the mouthpiece, sometimes when the robot's going to attach, if we have like a, a fresh heifer in there, she'll kick the inflation and it may rip right at the mouthpiece. Um, you know, this might lead to, to more failures down the road. So when you're doing your daily maintenance, just make a quick observation of those things. Um, but as far as addressing whether or not you have the right liner in the herd, uh, you know, I would say that's something that doesn't need to be visited any more than annually. So why do people skip? Why, why are liners sometimes overlooked when robot users do their daily maintenance? You know, it's, it's on there. I think they, they assume that it's something that they replace every so often anyway, so it's going to work perfectly up until the time it does get replaced. Um, some of the reasons why they don't necessarily get replaced on time are going to be uh, you forget which luckily on T4C it'll send us a reminder of when those need to be done or simply cost. A lot of people will try to stretch those out a little longer than the recommended life um, just to save a few pennies here and there. So what happens if the liners aren't replaced according to recommendations? Milk speed's a big one. Milk speed will, will continue to drop. Um, we can also see issues with bacteria counts. You know those liners, they, they begin to develop some pores throughout the life of them and uh, you know, butterfat can leach through them and, and find a home there and that causes issues with milk quality. You're just risking too much. You know, I'm not here to say that our liner will not last 10,001 milkings because it probably will, but uh, we can guarantee it to 10,000 milkings. If we go on beyond that, that's uh, kind of up to you and you risk that chance of, like I said, those liners tearing a lot more frequently, which will end up costing you a lot more money trying to get those pulsators adjusted after you get some milk and cheese built up in them. Any other tips or tricks that um, you would tell folks out there in our listening audience about their liners? You know, I think the, the main message I'd want to deliver is that uh, Laley does have a large portfolio of liners, um, so we can cater to, to each herd individually. And be sure to work with your local Laley Center to help decide which, which liner will be best for your herd. Caden, as we summarize today, what are the three key things that you would really um, advocate producers to look for um, as they continue to optimize their milk harvest? The three key things. I would say change your inflations in liners on time. 
Number two would be watch your cows. You know, make sure they're comfortable in the robot. And number three would be, you know, really focus with the, the help of the local FMS advisor on whether or not you have the right inflation in place. Um, everyone has different goals when it comes to their KPIs and T4C. Um, one an example that I've seen recently is someone that who, who really wants their box time less than six minutes. And they they went away from the Laley liner in order to do that. Um, and they, they got their box time down to about five minutes and 30 seconds. And their milk speed skyrocketed. So by looking at the KPIs there on, on T4C, they thought they were doing amazing. Um, another number that, that increased drastically was visits per day by cow. They went from about 2.9 to 3.4. Um, you could look at this and say, okay, maybe the cow's more comfortable, so she wants to come to the robot more often, but they weren't shipping any more milk. So by looking at that, that, that told me that uh, the reason why the cows were coming more frequently was because they were not being completely milked out um, once that, that inflation change was made. So at the end of the day, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, uh, you know, you got to look at all those KPIs because a, a 5 minute and 30 second box time at 3.4 visits may not necessarily be any better than a 6 minute 45 box time at 2.9 visits. Um, so really analyze that data and uh, make sure you're looking at the, the big picture. You know, it's, it's difficult just to pick one or two KPIs we want to make a difference on and, and uh, ignore the rest. Thanks, Caden, for helping our audience to think about the liners in their milking robot, or for those considering Lely Automations, how the Lely Center team consults about the milking process and finding the right liner fit. Whether you're milking with robots or not, our team would love to talk to you at our multiple locations at World Dairy Expo, October 1 to 5. And when you approach the arena building, talk to us about our lineup of smart feeding products and then come inside to hear how we continually hone in on the art of milking. Thanks everybody. You've been listening to Dairy Robot Radio, the show for dairy producers who want their questions answered by experts in dairy automation. Connect with us at dairyrobotradio.com to listen to all episodes and learn more about the topics and guests on the show. You can also find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify.